It is time for another episode of the Cultural Hall. It is an Articles of News episode, and uh, joining me, it's Megan the Mitch Mitchell. Hello, how are you? What's going on? Welcome back. Guten Tag. I was going to say, guten, guten Tag. Guten uh, Morgen. Been, you, uh, you, 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 what, you've been in uh, Midway? Sure. Did you go up to yes. Heber? Did you go up to Heber, the Swiss days? Is that? Uh, uh, nope, not till September. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's not what it is. No, you were out no. of town with your kid. You yes. took your favorite kid on vacation. For that 10 days, he would assume he was his, my favorite kid. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not yeah. you're not to the point where you're picking a favorite yet, is what I'm hearing. Although we oh, no, no, we all know favorite. we all know I have a favorite. It's my six-year-old, and everybody would agree that he's the favorite. Yeah. Okay. So I don't feel bad saying that. So that it's but. not him, the one that you went to Germany with. So it's like <laughs> what? You listen, I know that I've caused some trauma, a little bit of right. things in your life. You, I love you. It's not a question exactly. of loving you, but you aren't my favorite. Let's go to Germany. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Okay. Bit. okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We went to Germany with his uh, his German class, essentially. Mm -hmm. So he's been doing a German immersion since he was in first grade and he just finished seventh grade. Okay. So this was kind of the culmination of all of the work and all of the time. And it was pretty, pretty cool to see my kid experience all of that, like to watch him experience new, different, bigger, you know, seeing that the world is different than what he experiences here in America and in Utah. It was, it was pretty awesome. Pretty Did you get awesome. a, out a, uh, a magic carpet and then sing to him? Because uh, no, not this time. I wouldn't world. No. I was embarrassing him enough in front of his friends by like putting my arm around him and sure. trying to like hold his hand. So I have no enough. question. Why would you do that to a seventh grader? Do you want him to not have friends? <laughs> well, it was, it was funny because he, we were talking, I was like, I'm probably embarrassing you and I'm sorry, but also anybody that would make fun of you, they're just jealous because they really miss their mom. Sure. And so they're sad that their mom isn't here with them. And that's why they're making fun of you. Yeah, and, <laughs> but and they didn't really, they didn't make fun of him. They were fine, and I got along well with all of his friends, so it was all uh -huh. good. Is what you tell yourself? It sounds like. <laughs> 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 no, they didn't make fun of him, and I didn't know I'm the cool mom. I'm not like all the other moms. I'm the listen. Cool I mom. could do all of the skibbity toilet rizzes with the sigmas and the ohios and uh -huh, the uh -huh. caps and the fires and the. Uh -huh. Whizzle whistles, you know, sure. I could keep up with their vernacular. I have no idea what you just <laughs> so great. I'm glad it's okay. Go down the rabbit hole. No, you I won't. I no, won't. you don't want to, but I promise there are people who have teenage children who are listening who know exactly what I say. Okay. Exactly what I mean when I say skibbity toilet riz. Oh, nope. oh, geez. Okay. Yeah, they know. Yeah. I don't, I, and I don't want to. And don't. I don't want to. Let me ask you uh, this about that. Yeah. Um, so does he continue to duly immerse himself or is it done? Way to go. Seventh grade, forget everything you ever learned. You're going so, to Mexico on your mission. <laughs> uh, essentially, the immersion part stopped in sixth grade. And then in seventh and eighth grade, they do like a German culture class. Okay. So it's all taught in German, but they're learning more about the culture as opposed to like the language. So he did that class this year, mm -hmm. but then it is essentially repeated in eighth grade. So his class was a mix of seventh and eighth graders and all okay. the eighth graders had already taken it. Sure. And so um, he actually doesn't want to do that next year. So he's uh, moving to a new school. Okay. But we have a plan in place so that he doesn't lose his language skills. So my nine-year-old has been doing German immersion as well since first grade. Okay. And then my six-year-old is starting first grade and he's also going to do German. He's going to do Cantonese. Awesome. That's <laughs> right. incredible. Just once. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Just do something different. Yeah. But Ethan, my 13-year-old uh, is basically going to be their tutor. He's going to help them. And I've told him if you're going to stop like studying the language every single day at school, we should, I don't want you to like feel like the time was wasted or that you're going to lose the skills or anything. So I asked him like, talk with your siblings as much as you can in German. Mm -hmm. I've actually told him like, if you two get in a fight, I need you to have your argument in German mm. because it actually stops the fight really fast. Mm -hmm. um, I would think then, it would escalate it because the German language sounds so very uh, like tense and terse that you're like, I mean, what are you guys talking about? And they're right. like, listen, we love each other. Like, yeah, we're just emphatically telling each other that we love each yeah. other. That's yeah. all. No, it ends up really fast because like the nine-year-old can't come up with the words mm. necessarily. And sometimes the 13-year-old struggles figuring out how to answer to the things that she's saying, you know, so mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of, uh, it benefits everybody. 
Sure. When when I have them argue in German, but um, until one also, of them becomes a prodigy, spends countless hours, and then is able to one up the older child in the argument, and, be fun. and yeah, 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 that'll be. Fun. Then that's a whole different other host of problems. Exactly. But he also like down the line, he would like to take the AP German test when he's sure. in high school. Sure. So because he wants to do that, he wants to keep up with his studies just in other ways. So he'll do like Duolingo, which is yeah, whatever. But like when he gets to high school. They don't teach German at our high school, so he might do it during or through the community college Mm -hmm. and um, do things like listen to German music, read the Book of Mormon in German, kind of all of those things. Work at Schmidt's Bakery. Sure. All the things. Exactly. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And then depending on how baseball shakes out for him in high school, like if he doesn't make the team or whatever, then he might consider being an exchange student. Hmm. And yeah, so that's pretty cool. Now, now, uh, uh, let me ask you this about all of that. Because I think that's incredible if that's really what your kid wants to do. But how much of that being honest is from your kid and how much of that is you saying, you know, a plan and it's important to think about. And, hey, you don't want to make sure that's a waste because I guarantee you no seventh grader is like, you know, I'm really starting to consider whether or not my time in a dual immersion was a waste of my time or or maybe not. Some kids right. may think that way, but how much of that do you think is you trying to walk alongside, give guidance on the plan, and how much of that is him going, here's what I would really like to do? I would say it's a fair equal balance between the two of us. And okay. when we were finishing up our time in Germany, we were there for 10 days. And when we first got there, he was really like timid with his language skills and really didn't want to like interpret for me or anything. Mm-hmm. But by the end, He was like, mom, I cannot wait to come back to Germany. I really, really think it would be cool to be an exchange student. And my older, so there's a thing you can get when you graduate high school called the seal of biliteracy. Okay. And you, um, so if you're learning another language, you take a few different tests and then they compile it all together with your ACT score. And then you can get the seal of biliteracy. And my 16 year old who will graduate next year, she's already gotten hers in Spanish. And Ethan thinks that that's really cool that Mm -hmm. she was able to accomplish that. And so he has said independently that he really wants to get his seal of biliteracy. Mm -hmm. And he really thinks it would be great if he could uh, get, you know, pass the AP test and, you know, the German AP test. And so Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a healthy mix of both. I definitely want to see his language continue to, to be a part of his life and to continue to grow and expand. Um, So how how long till we ship off the 16 year old to somewhere that speaks Spanish? Let's get rid of um, her. Come on. Right. Yeah. Well, she, I presented the idea to her to next summer, go on like a trip to Peru. And mm-hmm. she's thinking about doing that. Okay. Um, but she's really funny. She's, um, so she's been studying Spanish for several years, but she thinks she's not good at it. Okay. And, um, like she actually, when she's at home and she's speaking Spanish, she speaks it re- with a really poor accent because she's just, I'm not good at this. So I'm just gonna, whatever. Mm-hmm. And, um, but then when she earned her seal of biliteracy, she was like, oh, maybe I actually can speak Spanish a little bit. Mm-hmm. And um, so she was not going to take Spanish for next year or like honor Spanish or something. But I think that she has changed her mind. Mm. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what she does with it. Yeah. Send her away. Jeez, get her out of there. Yeah. Uh, th- I So two things. One, yeah. uh, is the seal of literacy what I hope it is, which is like a heavy um, metal like thing that you dip in wax and that you're able to put on all of your documents. I am literate. And Seal of biliteracy. Yeah. Is yeah. there a, or like one of those metal stamps, like if you're a notary, is it something like that or is it something far less? So I believe you get a special rope at graduation and cool. I'm pretty sure they do like a notation of some kind on your diploma. Cool. And then you can put it on like resumes and things like that. Hmm. So it's, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, you don't stamp your ring in the ceiling wax or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. But. And and then the other thing is, um, you know, last year, I think it was when, when we spoke in sort of this opening part about your uh, ability to travel and how mm-hmm. everyone sort of said, oh, must be nice. And we kind of yeah. talked through that and, and says that, you know, that maybe says more about uh, the individual listening and have that reaction as opposed to, you know, that you are this world traveler, blah, blah, blah. You realize uh, how much people will hate you about the stories because of your kids, right? Like most parents are like, I'm trying to just get my kid to go to school, to get out of bed, to all of that. So 
I mean, it's contact at theculturalhall.com if you want to spew that uh, that uh, jealous right. hatred. But it's right. pretty amazing. It, it's it's really amazing, and I I feel like he's done seven years of work to be able to have this opportunity. You sure. know, it wasn't just like we didn't just wake up on June 2nd and said, Hey, on June 3rd, we're going to Germany, sure. you know, like he's been like fundraising. I mean, we, we like started this whole process for this school trip, like two years ago. Sure. Like it wasn't like, I think some people maybe hear me talk about travel and hear that, like, and think that it was just like, Oh, we just flitted off, you know, but it, it's, mm-hmm. it's not that. He liked and, German. So I thought, what yeah, better way? Yeah. He thought he might want to take the AP test in German. And so we've decided to try it out. It's, it's not. And then this was like, it was a sightseeing tour in that we saw a lot of sites, mm-hmm. but like we were going and going and going and going 12 hours a day, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, he got all of his tours at all of the castles in German, cool. you know, and he was like, they were all like, they got very strict instructions. You eat the food you're given. You don't yeah. complain when you try something new and sure. you know, um, you have to speak in German when you're in these different things. So it's, it's a little bit different than I, what, than probably what people have, uh, understood about my past travel which is funny because like I don't actually travel a lot I've just gone on a few big trips but they're pretty incredible but Mm -hmm. this one was it like this wasn't like when my husband and I went to Italy a year and a half ago like that was a different vibe you know this was very educational and yeah so that's wild to me by the way that the trip with your husband to Italy was a year and a half ago that seems like that was not very long ago uh, so a couple of things as we get into this one, if people have not listened to the episode that we relate released the other day, it's called second class saints. Uh, I believe it's episode number eight, one, seven, eight, 17. You can find it at the cultural hall.com. I would encourage you to go and check out that episode. We visit with Matt Harris and, uh, you know, I don't like to pick favorites as far as episodes go, but mm-hmm. I would say easily top 20, potentially top 10 of all of the episodes I've ever done with the cultural hall. So um, with this episode being in the, you know, the late uh, teens of the 800s, mm-hmm. that's a lot of episodes. It's a lot of conversations. It's a lot of uh, deep dives into things. And so worth checking out. Uh, And I would love to know what y'all think of it. Some people, I think, just at the very beginning, the very intro, we take that small snippet and say, here's a little bit about what it is. I don't know that everyone's going to go beyond that. I think that some people may hear that and go, "Eh, not for me. And I urge you to listen to it. Maybe it's, maybe I'm putting, maybe I'm putting a little bit of uh, what our friendship, our relationship on the line and saying, trust me, trust me to, uh, to listen to it. And uh, then, of course, let me know what you think. Contact at theculturalhall.com. Now, uh, my mom and I, uh, I should point out, Megan, uh, I, I'm not in a, a German immersion program uh, right now. Um, we're not going There's to- There's one school that teaches it, uh-huh. and it's here in yeah. my neighborhood. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I don't live in your neighborhood, and that'd be a heck of a commute, nope. not to mention creepy because I'm older. But yes. uh, my mom and I are going to take a train ride we uh, yes. are going to get my mom's dad uh, worked for the railroad for years and years and years. And so they used to be able to travel on the rail uh, for free, could go wherever, essentially, oh. back in the day. And she hasn't ridden a train since that time in her youth. And we were talking the other day. It is a thing that I have always wanted to do. So I'm not sure when. Certainly, it will be in the off season of all of the weddings and events and those kind of things. But my mom and I, we're going to go on our own German immersion trip where we nice. sit on a train and we traverse the country uh, in a sleeper car on an Amtrak. I, I, I was going to ask Amtrak. Yeah. That's the yeah. option, right? Yeah. yeah. You have Amtrak or you run and jump on a Union Pacific and hope that people don't catch you. Like those yes. are about the options as far as that goes. We're going to do the actual car, the sleeper oh. car, that is. And you get a first class attendant. I'm not sure what that means. It's just listed on the website, but um, there's different lines. You can do like the whole West Coast, like from San Diego up to Seattle. Uh, You can do like Chicago to Seattle. That's probably what we're going to do. Or we may go um, Salt Lake to Chicago. Um, Different different, uh, rail lines that take you where cars are not, which is pretty cool. So a lot of that uh, trip you're 
you're seeing things that you only really get to see from the rail line. So there's that. And then the other thing uh, that I need to bring up, I, I, I may owe you an apology. Okay. Um, I, I, I may be overreacting. Okay. Um, I, I maybe should have asked your permission, uh, but, but I, I, uh, I, I did something without even thinking and then immediately went, may, maybe I shouldn't have done this. Okay. And so I need to I need to walk uh, you through this. So okay. um, Facebook has this dumb thing where they say there's no way in the world you could have more than five thousand friends. So we'll okay. cap at five thousand friends. And um, and so uh, when you have uh, beyond the limit, anyone who sort of um, friends you, they get sort of waiting in a queue and say, you know, if a friend leaves Facebook and you occasionally maintain your page, you can you know, unfriend those people that have left and aren't on anymore and open up space for them or whatever. Um, so uh, I was on just moments before we got on this articles of news and um, lo and behold, um, your oldest daughter made a friend request to me on Facebook. Okay. And uh, I, 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 I said, I've heard so many great things about that individual and I like her mm -hmm. mom a great deal. Click and I accepted your uh your oldest but your daughter's uh, mm -hmm. Facebook friend, and then I immediately thought I uh, I don't know that I should have done that. Maybe <laughs> I should not have done this. And here's why: yeah. I have seen uh, a lot of people in my life, and I want to be very clear about how I talk about this. But I have yeah. seen a lot of people who, at the very um like the very like glimpse or a uh, very like uh n n like not any it, it not doing anything inappropriate but i have mm -hmm. seen people been just lit up yeah. for things that that didn't occur but because they looked sort of um like shady or what whatever right. the thing may be right yeah uh and, and uh, and I'll give you a, for instance, in, in my life that, that this applies in another way. So uh, I don't like babies. Everyone loves babies. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't care for babies uh, a great deal. Like, I think they're cute. And I kind of go, oh, aren't you so cute? But like, if people ask me to change the diaper of their child, I will not do that. Sure. And it's not and it's not because like I get any sort of weird twisted anything from it. Uh, and it's not because I'm like, oh, gross, poopy, or that's not my right. responsibility. I do not want to be in any sort of situation that would ever look like anything that would be inappropriate in the very slightest. Sure. And so now sense. I and so now I worry because I'm friends with your daughter on Facebook, and and <laughs> to be clear, she is an adult, so it's I, yeah. I feel like it's I feel like it's a, a a different situation than if she were fourteen. Right. A, a very vastly different uh, situation. Right. But but I don't know if I have just clearly overreacted. Uh, oh, and and uh, and I anyway, so I wanted to let you know that your daughter okay. and I are now social media friends and that I should have asked your permission first. Listen, I'm not I'm not uh, offended. I'm not I'm not stressed. Okay. Um, she's she's an adult who's learning how to navigate adult situations not that social media is inherently like an adult thing mm -hmm. but it is different when you become an adult like you use social media i believe in a very slightly different way maybe sure. than like a 14 year old um i will let you do with that what you want to if you would be more comfortable going back and reneging on the friendship yep. you know I'm fine with that, and she'll be fine with that. We, and, we have already chatted. I said, you, okay. I am honored to be your friend. Your mom says amazing things about you, and if you are half the amazing person that your mom says, watch out, world, and she said, geez, thanks. Oh, yeah, she's pretty cool. She's yeah. she's very, very awesome. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, if, if you were just like a rando who I had maybe done a podcast with one time, mm -hmm. I would have pause. Yep. You know, that it would be a little bit, it would be a different situation. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we, uh, we so there's that. So when she starts saying things like, have you seen the post that he created? I just didn't want that to be the way that you yeah. found out that I became friends with your adult daughter on social media. All good. <sighs> All good. <laughs> Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to do actual articles of news. 
bestdjinutah.com is the website. That is where you go if you would like me to come and DJ your event. Now, uh, will I do a family reunion where you all wear the same t-shirts? You bet I will. Will I travel to wherever you're at? Uh Uh-huh. Am I reasonable as far as what I cost? Yes. Yes. Do I bring a good time? Yeah, all the things. Listen, Best DJ in Utah, it's uh, my company. It's a thing I do that allows me to be able to have the time to do the cultural hall. So if someone's getting married, uh, you think, man, they need a great DJ. You're throwing a party, whether it's a 50th or 60th or 40th or 20th or whatever the party is. I've done them all and would love to be able to do that. An anniversary party, certainly done those. I did a baptism in 2023. Yeah, we did a big dance party at a baptism. Spoiler, not a Mormon baptism, but it was fun nonetheless. BestDJinUtah.com is a website. I will get back to you within 24 hours with a quote. Come on now. BestDJinUtah.com. Imagine running a small business today. It's challenging. Imaging and internet presence is an absolute must. Even with that, you're still a small star in a bright cyber universe. Now, imagine you have someone who understands how to get your site designed for your talents and then easily searched by potential clients. Imagine Lennon Design. Whether it's strictly a website or a whole package of logo creation, advertising media, and promotional materials, Lennon Design is your partner in business. They'll test the boundaries of their imagination to create something unique for you. When you need creative, affordable design, let it be Lennon Design. Call 801-699-3022 or visit LennonDesign.com. Here in the second half of Articles of News, we do actual articles of news. Hit it, Peter. You can't lose articles of news. And... Away we go. I love that we, uh, I've shifted. I, I gather the news and then to the, uh, various co-hosts that come on and, and we present the news. I say, listen, here is a whole helping, a heaping pile of news. And I would like you to pick, uh, some stories that you feel like are important. We will do our best to get through as many of these as possible. All of these stories, very, very pertinent. And so I hope that we will get through all of them. Um, We start first with having been in this sort of uh, odd interim time where we have said goodbye to Lloyd Newell, voice of music in the spoken word, but yet we have not heard from Derek Porter, the new voice of the music in the spoken word. Yeah, so um, I got to admit, when I read the article, I wasn't sure exactly when it was when it was published. Mm -hmm. So it said, like, this Sunday is Lloyd Newell's final broadcast. And I don't know if that was like four days ago Sunday or the Sunday when I was in Germany. So Mm -hmm. I don't know when his actual last broadcast was, except that it's been recent. So it it was, as we record it, it was Mm -hmm. four days ago. As people are listening to it, it's five or six days ago. Um, And so this will come out before Derek Porter has done his first one. That means this coming Sunday, we get a rerun. I'm guessing. No, 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 it's a, no, he's stepping right in. Well, no, but this Sunday, is this Sunday the 23rd? I think so. Oh, it is. Okay. We good. We good. I, no reruns. Yeah. Why would we, why would we get a rerun ever? Because I thought that the 23rd was Uh in two Sundays. Yeah, no. Until I still don't know what day it is. Okay. Wait, Um, why, 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 if this Sunday was in two weeks as the 23rd, would we get a rerun? I don't, listen, Richie, I can't explain it. They don't do reruns. I. No unhallowed hand shall stop the work from progressing. Persecutions may rage, rain, sleet, and dark of night. I might have the uh, quote mixed up a little Boy bit. Boyd Newell listen, leads, leaves to be a mission president. Yeah, right? going to uh, Los Angeles. He's going to be a mission yes. president in Los Angeles. So this was interesting. He's been the voice of the music and the spoken word and other things too. Like he's announcing for conference and mm-hmm. the Tabernacle Choir Christmas concerts. He kind of like kicks it off, you know. So he does a lot. He, I would say he is the voice of the Tabernacle Choir, yes. right? But yeah. like most predominantly for music and the spoken word. But he's been there since 1990, and he is only the third announcer in the 95 year history yes. of music and the spoken word. And that's pretty incredible. As you said, he's leaving to be a mission president in LA. And this Sunday, the 23rd of June, Derek Porter will take over as the voice of the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. And uh, I don't know much about Derek Porter other than like what has been said. I think he's like my age, which is pretty, pretty crazy to think about. And I think he has six kids like me. So, you know, we're basically best besties, but. Um, yep. You're basically the same person. In fact, I'm not convinced individual. it's not you, that you right? are not Derek Porter. It's most likely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We both have brown hair. So, um, um but <laughs> Yeah, wishing uh, Brother Porter well as he begins this new uh, endeavor. And 
yeah, I wonder how long he'll stick around. It'll well, be the, 34 years or longer or shorter or, you know. Here is what I um, am like hmm, 2% upset about. I mm-hmm. wanted to hear uh, Derek Porter's voice. Yeah. I mean, we'll obviously hear it as we uh, as we get into, you know, music and the spoken word. He will be the spoken word of it. And so we'll be able to hear it. But I wanted to hear if he, because one of the distinctive things about Lloyd Newell, besides being able to write just amazing um, parts mm-hmm. of music and the spoken word, is he has a very distinct voice. I was doing some quick searching. I know we had Lloyd Newell in the cultural hall, but for some reason I can't Google mm-hmm. search and find him. So hopefully we can find the number of that episode. We'll put it in the show notes. But uh, amazing I- individual and amazing distinct voice. And um, and and I and I worry. I know that Derek will do an amazing job as far as probably the written word goes. Sure. You study it out. You pray it out. All the things. But like, it, it, I'll have a really hard time if it's like. From the crossroads of West, <laughs> yeah, Salt Lake's temples. You know, like I, I, I have concerns about that. Yeah, it's missing the point, that. but I have concerns. I can see that for sure, and I do still fall into that camp that would have loved to maybe see a a sister, mm-hmm. maybe elevated to that position, and it's fine. It's not the it's not the deal breaker, you know, but. It would have been neat. I also was really hoping for Thurl Bailey, but you know. Oh yeah! Whatever. Oh my gosh! I know he's, and I told you he's their warm up act, so he couldn't mm-hmm. just like. Yes, stepped in. It's fine. Stepped it's in. Fine. Yeah. Uh, a- another interesting take they could have done, and and an aside on that, uh, the Spanish um, speaking music in the spoken word, they have a couple of hosts, and one of which right. is a woman, so that's significant. Um, Thorough Bailey would have been cool. I would have loved that uh, every part of the spoken word would have been uh, done in the form of a question. If we would have had Ken Jennings uh, yeah. be the spoken word, that could have been uh, a fascinating sort of lean into. What is um, the crossroads of the okay. list? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, various other people. I, and you know what? That might be fun. Contact at the cultural hall.com your irreverent picks for who could have <laughs> been Lloyd Newell's replacement. We spent way more time on that story than I thought we would. Tell me why yeah. we bought the Kirtland Temple. So um I had I don't know that I had ever heard that how much we spent on that whole acquisition, mm-hmm. but it was hundred and ninety-two point five million dollars. And there's a lot of people who would question, well, why would we spend that much money to buy a building? And we are not even going to like use it for its intended purpose that it was built for. Um, so Elder Kyle S. McKay, he is the church's historian and recorder. He said, the significance of what happened in this temple cannot be overstated. So in, um, uh, he said, uh, if one cop, oh, sorry, I'm losing the plot. Hang on. We can better appreciate the significance of what was restored to the earth on that day in 1836. So he talks about how um, in 1836, that was when Jesus Christ appeared to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. Mm -hmm. Um, He told them who he is. He forgave their sins and a vision followed of Moses, giving them the keys of the gathering of Israel. Elias then appeared and the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham. And last was Elijah announcing that the time had come to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Having thus spoken, Elijah restored the keys of this dispensation, or what the church today calls the sealing power. So the church as we know it really probably, I mean, it would eventually get there because the Lord, as you said, no one held him. Like nothing's going (laughs) to stop the work. But without those events in the Kirtland Temple you know, maybe things would have taken longer to be restored. Maybe things, I don't know. But um, when he puts it into that perspective of like the significance of that event, like there's really no price that's too big. You know, there's no price that's too high, no dollar amount that's too much. Right. And right. so, yeah, that's what Elder McKay has to say about it. Yeah, significant. If no one, uh, you know, uh, other religions have the faiths where you uh, where you make the pilgrimage maybe once a year or once in a right. lifetime you go to the place. It really is uh, an incredible experience when you get to go to any of the church historical sites. And there are so many tours. I'm I'm not advocating for one over another, but to be able to go and sort of timeline it where you're like, mm-hmm. this is the place where Joseph prayed. This is the place where he translated the Book of Mormon. This is the place where the, the key is. This is the place where he was martyred. That Like... Mm-hmm. 
to be able to stand in those places and be able to go, oh, this is a real place. And you obviously yeah. know that it's a real place, right? You read it and you're not like, oh, well, this is some great, you know, made up gobbledygook, fun, right. that's something. Um, but to actually be there, spirit aside from feeling it in the place, I think that there's something that um, that, that like transfers, transitions in your mind where you go here. Yeah. That thing yeah. that, has instructed my life, informed my life, changed my life um, for those that are maybe converts or, you know, not necessarily. I mean, they, I think it changes everyone's life. But to be able to go, this, mm -hmm. this is where that particular thing occurred. I remember oh, the, yeah. first, oh, sorry, first, go ahead. the first time it ever rang true for me um, at the John Johnson farm in Hiram, Ohio. That was the first uh, kind of like, oh, uh, experience that I had that was um, th they still have this the stone the stoop where Joseph preached from after he was tarred and feathered oh, and wow. so it was like oh right like this this rock here in the past held yeah. the feet of the prophet you know after he had been tarred and feathered a similar experience in the Whitney store and some other things so you know it's more than just like wouldn't it be a fun thing mm -hmm. I just want to have the time with family I think it can be incredibly instructive as far as you know testimony that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I've, and the other the other part of it with I think the the Kirtland Temple, and I'm sure that the uh, Elder McKay would never say something like this. There's another guy who was going to buy it, and oh, so I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and he was like, "Come on," and you know the uh, the community of Christ Church in in some financial woes was like, "Hey, ah, uh, so it's a pretty good offer from right. this gentleman." It had been a private entity at that point. Pretty sure. good offer from this gentleman. Uh, what do you say, mainstream LDS right. church? And they're like, all right, yeah, let's do this. And here's what, how we it. can make this yeah. for what you guys want. So, Well, and I was going to say that I think just um, obviously those are important for church history, right? To have mm -hmm. those experiences of being in the hallowed ground. But when I was when I was in Germany, we took all of the kids to the Dachau concentration camp memorial site. And we also took them to no man's land at the Berlin wall Jeez. and watching the kids have that realization of like, cause in both of those places, there's like a, a visceral like presence, like it's, it's, it's heavy. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and you're, you're listening to these tour, like to these like audio tours and these things. And, you know, Earlier that day, all of the 13 year old boys were like jumping on each other and wrestling and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But like to watch them have that realization mm -hmm. that this was, this is real. You know, this isn't just something we've read about. Mm -hmm. Like this was like, you know, what happened in the Kirtland Temple? It's not just something that we read about in the Doctrine and Covenants and in church history, right? Yeah. And yeah. what happened at these sites in Germany, it's not just something that we read about or have heard about in our history class. It's putting the, Almost like putting the face to the name, it, it makes it so much more impactful. Mm -hmm. So I'd agree. Uh, something that I forgot to ask your permission for, but I want yeah. to use the picture of you and your son in your German clothes as the yes. image for this episode. Will you send that to me? Absolutely. And that, uh, that is, I, I'm assuming that that's what you wore to church this last Sunday. Am mm -hmm. I correct in that assumption? Because yes. of course you did. Uh, I love when people cosplay at church, like when people <laughs> rent tuxedos. Yeah, And then they still have them over the weekend. So they'll wear their tuxedo to yeah. church on Sunday. People don't do that as much anymore. I haven't no. seen it for a bit, but yeah. they still do do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the various things where, um, you know, someone served their mission in, you know, Polynesia somewhere. Right. And they're blah, like, blah, blah, I, blah. I, I still with, you know, it's my mission tradition. And they're the whitest of white person right. is like, yeah, I went to Polynesia and I still do this. Right. I if love it, that we do that. I if love it that. helps anything, we have a lot of German heritage. Uh -huh. So it does we, not, we but keep trying. Buy it honestly. But <laughs> my my son's shirt, it didn't have a collar, so he can't wear a tie with it. And he uh -huh. was so concerned. He's like, Mom, I can't pass the sacrament if I don't wear a tie. And I'm like, You'll be fine. Mm -hmm. It's traditional attire, but mm -hmm. it's not going to struggle. But what you don't know is that I also bought him a full leader hosen. Oh. So he's got the leader hose in the shirt, socks, shoes, hat, mm -hmm. the whole nine yards. And he was like, when he tried it on, he's like, do I have to wear this to church? And I'm like, no, <laughs> unless you're not wearing it to church. I'm not going to make you wear that one to church. You wear the, the dress outfit that I got you. You wear that one to church. But then I was like, but I will take you up to Oktoberfest at Snowbird. And I do expect you to wear the leader hose in. And sure. all of the teenage girls are going to want pictures with you. Yes. 
and you will love that all of the teenage girls want to get a picture with you. So look forward to that, young gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> um, this interesting uh, about the church in Sudan. Yeah. Uh, according to the church news, legal status uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Sudan was lost in 2013. For people who don't know, huge civil war, country went into chaos. 2.2 um, million South Sudanese fled to neighboring countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo during the war. Um, and at that time, it w- the church couldn't be in uh, in the uh, country of Sudan. Members of the church lived without a registered church for over a decade. In 2023, um, the Africa Central Area's legal council said, hey, you know what? Let's get back in here. Let's get this happening. And um, I, I can't think of a better way to heal people that have been traumatized by war than allowing the church to be able to come back in. On February 7th of, of this year, 2024, the church's legal status in South Sudan was renewed. On May 26th, members of the church gathered at the Radisson Blue Hotel in Juba for the reorganization of the Juba branch. And the church news that was reported that baptisms have not been performed in South Sudan since the Civil War began. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints first received legal status in 2009, so only a four short years. Um, and now the return of the church comes at an important time. More than half of the country's 11 million people are under the age of 18. So the growth of the church there in Africa just continues to astound me. And now uh, the Sudanese people can can um, benefit from the, the church being able to legally and officially be in their country. And I'm, I'm telling you, you know, a branch now and watch for it a couple years. Several stakes. Yeah, it's a couple stakes, five years, a temple, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, if, if the growth there is um, anything like Democratic Republic of the Congo, which I think will come up in our later news again, um, just incredible growth. And I love, I love to hear it and I love to see it. Take me then okay. to the next story, would you please? So the church has um, established some um, resources for ministering to those who are incarcerated okay, and to also their families and individuals who are affected by what somebody may have been incarcerated for. Okay. Um, all of these resources can actually be found on churchofjesuschrist.org and the gospel library app. Okay. Um, there was a quote in here um, from former guest of the cultural hall, Portia Lauder, friend of oh, the show. Oh, awesome. Um, she says, I spent four and a half years in federal prison. I know that the way that I was loved and supported made a huge difference. When you can see somebody and recognize their divine potential, maybe even before they can see it, you can make a profound impact on their life. Um, found within these resources are um, things that you might do to prepare for going and administering to incarcerated individuals, Mm -hmm. um, various guidelines that are to be followed, as well as uh, safety tips, Mm -hmm. um, provides help for leaders as they establish worship worship services in correctional facilities, managing of records, and how to make use of church and community resources. In a video directed to leaders, Elder Dale G. Renlin of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles told stake presidents that organizing stake members to help minister in a prison facility will be a blessing to the stake. After, or sorry, all that you call to serve in this situation will be changed forever. All who are called to serve will understand the atonement of Jesus Christ better. All will come back to the stake more committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of repentance, and all that is core to the doctrine of Christ. And then Elder Ahmad S. Corbett said, there's something uniquely sanctifying about ministering to others who cannot do things for themselves that you can do for them. Prison ministry enables us to have the kind that kind of sanctifying, truly Christ-like experience. And then, like I said, there's lots of resources for children and teens and others who are impacted. Um, but I really, really love this a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. A couple of so, pickups uh, just to point people to some episodes that we've done um, in and around uh, the prison slash jail um work that is done um, for and by the church. Uh, Portia's episode that you mentioned is episode 564. Find a link for it in the show notes. Uh, And then also, um, 
I know his first name is Jim. I'm just trying to find his Dunnigan as his last name. Um, oh, is he the education one? He is, uh, no, although oh, that's a was... great one. I don't have that number in front of me. I'll try and track that down and put it in the show notes. Uh, he was the, or, or is, may still be, this has been a couple of years since we did this episode, number 491. He uh, was the branch president at that's right. the jail and talks about um, the life changing calling that is and the experience that is literal life changing for some of the inmates that he's been able to work with. And you can hear him um, weep in that yeah. episode for the, uh, the blessings that he's had and, and be able to do it. So if you're a newbie to the cultural hall, one of the great things about the cultural hall being around for 13 years, it's a whole treasure trove of episodes. And so we've had the opportunity to have some really great conversations. I'd point you towards a couple of those to be able to check that out. Uh, this is cool. Uh, it's fun to say the MTC and the DRC Democratic Absolutely. Republic of the Congo, uh, this is going to open in August of 2024. And it, it is exactly what the, uh, the way I headlined it is there will be an MTC just like, I shouldn't say just like, it's not going to be, yeah, just, there's some differences. Yeah. It won't be just like Provo. No. Uh, in sheer number among other things, but right. there will be a training center for missionaries in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Very cool. In 2022, a limited number of missionaries were able to receive training at a temporary training center. And that just showed that they have the need for it. Um, like you said, the capacity is going to be much lower at 200 missionaries and those who come already need to know French. So mm -hmm. it sounds like there won't be um, language training there per se, but uh, yeah. So they need they already they need to already speak French, and it will be a short drive from the Kinshasa Democratic Republic of the Congo Temple. Hmm. Wait, wait, so again, just uh, absolutely significant. Opens in August of this year. Hey, maybe talk to your young uh, going into uh, first grade and say German puh, nine. <laughs> tell them about the. Um, you know, when you are older, you can live <laughs> in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and not smoke, oh. although I am doing the smoking motion right now. <laughs> wear a beret. And wear a beret on your mission. And you, can you know, he really, he likes pretending to be a mime, so maybe he'd be into it. He'd be in, he'd be in for the beret. The rest, uh, he can learn. <laughs> It can convert for the rest of it. I seriously, so cool. Um, right. You know, we had that that guest even just a couple of months ago, um, giving us sort of the update uh, in Africa. I am mm -hmm. strongly considering visiting with that gentleman once a quarter and saying, "Tell us what's new," and just being able to share that because there's such explosive growth in the continent of Africa and and the areas and the empty season, the right. temple and the, all that. So, well, um, I think Sean is his name. So yeah, Sean, he was you are like listening to this Irish, right? Yeah, Sean or uh, Sean, Sean, Sean McShagan, Sean McDougal. I don't know. <laughs> well, I was going to say that it's, you know, in a, the past few years, they've actually closed. The church has closed several MTCs from around the world. Mm -hmm. But maybe like this is the model. Like just have small little localized MTCs, especially mm. where things like travel is maybe uh, prohibitive, you know, um, that like, I mean, because we have missionaries who are serving in America who go to the Mexico MTC to learn their language because sure. it makes the most sense, right? Sure. But why couldn't there be like an MTC in like Brisbane, Australia that, you know, you could go and do your MTC training there, you know, but just cap it at just like a few, you know, 200, mm -hmm. you know, just maybe it would be an interesting model where you don't have these giant ones that then you close it and it's probably a bummer, you know, if you have these small ones that would be easy to like staff and maintain. And um, anyway, I just thought about that. Um, the other thing that I think about, and this just shows my ignorance um, to that part of the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. Don't think that I realized that French was as dominant as it is. Yeah. French and Portuguese too. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I, I had no idea. Yep. Yeah. And Dutch. So, Okay, now you're just naming things. Now you're just, <laughs> now you're just saying it. I know. Um, I love uh, this next story in that, you know, I I have presented that story to several people, so I'm going to let you take it. Um, hey. But uh, former member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, 
Jewel, it is no coincidence that her greatest hit in her entire life, you know the title, I hope. You were meant for me. No, who will save your soul? Oh, yeah, that one. Okay. Yeah. Oh, who will okay. save you? Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. I went with her other one. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> this is a religious show. Of, yes. You were meant for me is a whole different thing. Tell me about uh, what she had to say about being raised in the church. So, yeah. So, Jewel says that she was. Um, so, I got to lead off. She's a four time Grammy nominee, which is amazing. She's extremely talented. She, you know, I was kind of coming of age as a teenager when she was really popular. So, she was a little bit of like the soundtrack of my teenagehood. And okay. Do you, do you remember a pop-up video on VH1? Of course, where the little Kiss. thing would go, boop, yeah. boop, and then yeah. it'd be like, Jewel uh, from Nephi, Utah. Boop, boop. Exactly. Yep. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's where I first learned that Jewel was raised a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Mm -hmm. um, I was on pop-up video. And um, she's now 49, and she's kind of taken a step back from fame a little bit, although she did sing the national anthem at the NBA All-Star Game when it was here in Salt Lake. So that was fun. Mm -hmm. Um but so she, she was raised, she says, in a pretty strict LDS household. Um, however, her mom left when she was eight years old, and then things kind of crumbled from there. Mm -hmm. um, her father became very abusive, and he was very, um, he was an alcoholic. And um, she knows now, her father is a man named Atz Kilcher, who is okay. apparently the star of a television show on Discovery called Alaska, The Final Frontier. Interesting. Um, so that's Jules' father. And um, she knows now through like her own healing process that he as a Vietnam War veteran mm -hmm. was very much uh, struggling with PTSD throughout his life. And so she left home when she was like 15 years old. She would do odd jobs and everything. Um, but her family was raised on a 300 acre ranch in Homer, Alaska. And she then just kind of did some, she was homeless for a while in LA. She lived in her own little cabin by herself after she left home as a teenager. Um, but then, like I said, through a lot of healing and therapy and everything, um, she was ready to reconcile with her father when he got sober, um, which happened, excuse me, just a few years ago. So she was like, I just don't want to carry that anymore. And, um, but yeah, pretty, she's, I've always felt that like, if we're going to have somebody who was raised in the church, but then, left the church like she's never said anything bad about it you know she's never said that like it was negative and i and i appreciate that you know she's just kind of like yeah that was like my life and then it wasn't and you know and i've always loved her music and her style and um there's rumors that she's dating kevin costner which he has denied so <laughs> that's uh, the aside that is that. irrelevant thank you. thank you thank you no thank you you know the thing that's interesting to me and you see this like with like tara westover mm -hmm. um the author of the book educated there's a new yeah. book that i just recently uh I like to say read, but listened to, listen to called motorhome prophecies it's this okay. woman um her her dad is um uh, oh i don't know uh suffers from scrupulosity maybe um, or just is sort of overt, does the thing where it's like, well, if paying 10% is great, then paying 20% means twice. It's like that kind of thing. Yeah. And it's interesting for me when um, people have fame and or um, are able to rise to fame, like Carrie Shuffled with her book, Motorhome Prophecies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's re being received very well. Um, and is, are, is she a member of the church or was she? She was. Okay. okay. Um, and, and that's what I think is so curious because I think in the minds of these individuals, and I'm no sort of psychologist or psychiatrist, they go, this was part of the reason why this person was this way. And mm -hmm. the ability to separate the two from each other, I think it, it is near impossible. Yeah. He, he yeah. was this way because of instruction that he received from this group. I can't even imagine being able to walk toward that group and not being constantly triggered. I just find it to be a fascinating thing. The, the most interesting thing um, about the motorhome prophecies, and you don't hear this very often, it's why I'm giving some sort of ringing endorsement. Find a link to purchase the book in the show notes, everybody. Um, but uh, she is she was a member of the church, then left, was like agnostic, said, no thanks, Tom Hanks. And then uh, is now a uh, Christian, but another faith. And you do not hear about that very often. Usually people yeah. sort of step away and go, nope, if there is a God and if there is a Jesus, then he missed it. And I don't know why I had to do that. So her story from that perspective is also fascinating. 
And and uh, as you probably imagine, some of the crazy in that book, you're just like, wait, what? Yeah. Um. So definitely worth checking out. Is is it something you're going to get at um, Deseret Book? No, it's not. It's not something <laughs> that you'll find there. But there is, if you like reading about things that are sort of in and around the church, mm-hmm. I think that it's a a, a well done. Um, book. And I like to say that I read books, even though I listen to them. So take that. Uh, Tell me about the church in Colombia. Yeah. So the church made a $1.6 million donation to UNICEF, which will help um, 72,905 children and mothers um, in various cities in Colombia. Um, They will receive safe water and sanitation or have access to more safe water and sanitation. And they made a point to point out that a lot of that will be creating better infrastructure in schools, particular, particularly rural schools. That's the nice hardest work. word Got it. to say. Got it. Um, they, it will contribute to malnutrition prevention and expanded vaccination initiatives, as well as um, helping with food insecurity. So uh, doing a lot of work for the children and mothers in Colombia. And Just I a couple of uh, quick statistics that I think drive that home. 60% of rural schools lack adequate water, sanitation structure, hindering the well-being. 15.5 million people in Colombia live in food insecurity, which means they don't know where their next meal may come from. Child malnutrition in the country of Colombia, 400,000 children under five are malnourished. Hmm. And uh, uh, 72,323 children in Colombia lack proper vaccination. And the church has said, nope. Let's see what we can't do to to improve that. So incredible. I know that the church, most of the stories that even that we would share here are 150 billion, 200 and whatever billion. What are we doing? We're building temples. And I think it's it is worthwhile taking the moment to say, oh no, they they did this and will literally save the lives of thousands right. with that um donation to UNICEF. Right. Um take me where you'd like to go next. Uh, let's see. Mm-hmm. Really quick, the primary has um, created a social media account called Primary Worldwide on Facebook and Instagram. This is following um, the young men and young women have both done that. The Relief Society have has done that. It will include singing time helps, lesson ideas, activity um, ideas. And that, this was actually just launched in April, on April 19th of this year. Um, so that's going to be an excellent resource. And then I'm going to skip the number nine story that I put because I don't have any notes on it. Okay. So I'll skip to number 10, the Wells Ward fire. So this was. Let me just make a quick aside before we get to the fire. Um, Yes. Here is what I think happened. Are you ready for my pontification on this? I think President Freeman got in. And in the first meeting where everybody got together, I think she said, (laughs) guys, what are we doing? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I will teach you. But we have to do this. And then the young people were like, we'll go first. And they did. And then she was like, she's looking across in the meeting when it's the, you know, the young men and the young women. She's like, guys, what are you doing? Let's go. And they're like, all right, you're right. right." And then, you know, the the primary, she, she, you know, you have to be a little sweeter. The primary, they're a little bit sweet. And you just go, guys, let's do this. Come on, let's go. And I, I, it, in a in a church that in some ways we're so on the cusp of things, it seems funny that it's 2024 when we're finally saying, and it's primary worldwide. It's like, okay. Well, and, and I can see maybe the a little bit of a reason for a delay with a primary social media account, because with the Relief Society, young men and young women, your primary audience is going to be the people that you're serving. It's going to mm-hmm. be the youth. It's going to be the adults. And there's not a lot of primary kids who are on social media. You know, so this is going to have to really be geared more toward the leaders, you sure. know, and the people serving in the primary. And so that's where it probably differs a little bit. Um, but I think it, I think it's cool, you know, and yep. uh, they are doing some good things with the social media in the various organizations of the church. And I wonder if the reason that there was a hesitancy to do it is just for like correlation purposes, could be. you know, that. Like, we just can't let you go and speak for all of, like, the young women because we don't know what message you're putting out. We don't, you know. And so maybe they needed to kind of figure out ways to build up an infrastructure so that that wasn't an issue. Well, and look no further than the Relief Society with President uh, Dennison. Dennis? Dennis? Dennis. Uh, no, President is Camille Lynn Johnson. Uh, yeah, but oh, yeah, yeah. The I know presidency, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, the me- and the message there that just... 
where I'm sure at, at, at headquarters they said, uh, this is why we didn't want to do this. Right. 19,000 comments. But to your point, it's the very reason that they should do it. The other thing, yeah. I think it's so cute that you don't think that kids are on social media. I mean, no, no, no. I mean, they, <laughs> they are. But I do know from my own children, mm -hmm. the way that they consume social media is very it's different. different. Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah, like yeah. my teenagers are going to look at, well, really, they're just going to send me stupid reels on Instagram. Sure. But if they come across something from President Freeman, you know, or like there's been a lot of FSY content that has been being shown because it's FSY season, you know, they're they're going to consume it where in a way that's going to be like they're going to take it in and mm -hmm. it's going to be really impactful for them. Whereas like my nine year old gets on my Instagram and she just wants to watch videos of the Radio City Rockets. Like that's really? all she wants to do. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like. My son, if he ever got on my six year old, it would be to like watch dinosaur content, you know, like they're, they're just not, they just consume it differently. So yes, they're there, but it's definitely a different dynamic. Yeah. Uh, okay. We got a couple more stories and I do want to get through them. So let's make yes. sure that we do. Uh, you already sort of introed it. The Wells, yes. Wells, Wells with my Utah accent. That's hard to say. <laughs> Wells Ward Chapel fire. Yeah. So a couple uh Sundays ago. I remember this was right before my daughter graduated. So it was like three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago. Um, there was a huge fire at the Wells Ward Chapel, which is in Salt Lake City. It's in the Liberty Wells area. So sort of around Liberty Park. Got it. It's okay. kind of east side-ish. Yeah. Yep. So it was it was a huge fire. It took 80 firefighters to put it out. But while they were while they were doing what firefighters do they also saved two people who were on the balcony of the church who um they heard when they started fighting the fire they heard screams coming and so they were able to rescue those two people um i have not heard what those two people were doing there Squatters. because right because the building was no longer in use and it was scheduled for demolition because it was damaged in the 2020 earthquake mm -hmm. so it has not been used at all like for mm -hmm. anything and so it's just been sitting empty and the church says they are unaware of any like art or artifacts or anything of historical significance that would have been damaged and like i said it was going to be demoed anyway but mm -hmm. it was a pretty big one well and and big. this was the like the hub of at least that part of the community for a long time for the church this is places and this will be foreign to a lot of people but like when they used to have um and they used to do this too. This is probably a surprise to folks as well. When you know how you have church ball, the deacons are playing yeah. against the deacons in the stake. They used to do it like the final four and oh, yeah. your region, et cetera, would come into Salt Lake to play. And one of the places that would, they would play is at that Wells Chapel. My seminary teacher was a coach for one of those basketball teams. You're out of town. And it was actually a team that was created of players from the Navajo reservation. Interesting. And the year he coached them, they won like so the take, whole thing. And that's why you chose him to be your seminary teacher. Nope. Had nope. no choice, but he was also awesome. So it was a fine choice. I loved my classes with brother Krikova, but it was interesting. He brought in a picture one day of him and his team. So this was when he was super young. I mean, we're mm -hmm. talking six, like early sixties, like mm -hmm. when this happened and uh president, or maybe it was president Kimball was in the picture. So maybe it was more in this. I don't know. But it was black and white. But President Kimball was in the picture with my seminary teacher and the team. Hmm. Um, it, anyway. It's sad, tragic about this particular building. A lot of people like myself really feel like every time that we sort of raise one of these mm -hmm. uh, buildings that we lose a little part, part of our church history. And it, it's true. And you certainly can't save all of them or would right. be maybe ridiculous to save all of them. But I'm sad to have it gone. And, uh, you know, there is some suspicion that uh, those people were paid to do that mm. um, because then it, it uh, when things are dangerous like that, you don't have to have certain permits mm. because it's for the safety of things. And so that, along with some other fires that have happened uh, recently, every time I go, I see a fire on a structure like that, I go, who do they pay? And how do I yeah. find out? How do I get on that list to be able to do that? It's the same with Whenever you, and you'll see this in your neighborhood, not only in Utah, but all across the world, where uh, that really, really big, expensive house that's taken <laughs> a long time in your neighborhood, and then all of a sudden it goes up in flames. I'm not saying 100% of the time, but I am saying close to 100% of the time. People, <laughs> it is not an accident. My house has never just accidentally started on fire. 
Yeah. There are, it's the insurance money, and it's sometimes the only way people can get out of the things that they did too much. Something nefarious. Yep. Uh, earlier this month, that is uh, in the month of May, Church Elder Anthony D. Perkins, General Authority 70 and President of the Middle East and North Africa region at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and his wife, uh, Christine Perkins, met with uh, Dr. Sheikh Abdullah bin Ahmed Al-Khalifa of Bahrain to discuss and potential interfaith projects. Um, this is in incredible because uh, the LDS church has had a presence in 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 what I'm sorry for everyone that I'm going to ca- create the earworm in your um ear a presence in manamana for over 50 years do do during the meeting they touched on issues of common interest um there is a particular center uh, that was established in 2018 it aims to promote coexistence and peace through various activities. And so look forward to a considerable amount of interfaith um, dialogues, opportunities for those things to coexist um, between the uh, LDS church and also uh, with Dr. Sheikh Abdullah bin Ahmed Al-Khalifa of Bahrain. Um, Incredible. Incredible to see the growth that they're going on. We've gone long, but we're going to do it. Go. Okay. Um, Snowflake, Arizona is apparently a huge hub for growing pot. And, and, and a huge hub for Mormons. Huge hub for Mormons. So uh, it was settled in 18, or, yeah, 1878 when Brigham Young sent five families down to Snowflake to kind of settle it. Mm-hmm. But it now has the largest greenhouse operation for growing pot in the state of Arizona. Pot did not come to Snowflake through the church. It came from a gentleman named Fife Silmington the fourth, okay, who is the CEO of Copper State Farms, and he saw the potential because like the climate is apparently really good for growing pot in Snowflake. Mm-hmm. Um, it employs uh, two hundred people, and this article is really funny because it goes into this whole thing about like, well, where do Mormons stand on pot and all of this stuff, and it was just kind of funny to me. Like it was, I was like, this is like a really weird connection, like. There's, there's people who do different things, even in like Mormon enclaves, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, but also I've heard there's like a lot of paranormal activity and stuff like as well. So maybe not paranormal. Hmm. UFOs. Like ghost? Oh, no, okay. UFOs. So maybe okay. not paranormal, Okay. But ex- extraterrestrial activity. Well, okay. Uh, here's the deal. Let me ask you, um, I gave you no sort of heads up about this and not to worry, uh, the story for number 13, we already did. So we don't have to go. Oh, okay. Uh, but do you like that it's 13 articles of news? Uh, yeah, we I did do. that once upon a time. Trying to bring it back. Uh, you, you have a great job. Hey, Megan, the Mitch Mitchell, we would love to hire you. Um, uh, we're a company that greenhouses pot. Uh, you have a tremendous, uh, amount of knowledge, um, in social media. We would love to hire you to be our social media director. Do you work or no? No, you do not. No. Okay. Uh, and, and, and I'm curious, you do not because. Um, I can have my own personal feelings on something like, Uh like marijuana use or like medical marijuana use or CBD, but I also don't like those feelings and thoughts and opinions. They would be on either side. Like, regardless of where I fall, it's going to be controversial to somebody else. Sure. And so I like that's just waters that I just wouldn't want to to step into. Do you think that it's possible for a member of the church temple recommend holding to be able to do something like that? I think it would depend on the bishop. (laughs) It's the best answer ever. (laughs) But I mean, but I mean, fundamentally, like if, you know, you're you're uh, you're getting to know you can move in a new ward and you're like, oh, where do you work? I work. At the pot greenhouse. Oh, what do you do? I, uh, I'm a botanist. Oh, do you smoke? Yeah. No, I don't. I don't use it, but I, I grow it. Yeah, that's that's. I'm sure they could pretend. Like, I'm sure it would be fine. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I personally discussion. wouldn't like hold judgment against them. Like, if it was me personally, but I could see that there would be people who would. Sure. And that would because be, people are yeah. terrible. People judge people for all of the things. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I want to offer you a job. Uh, it's going to okay. cause you to relocate. Um, think about it. It's okay. um, to Snowflake. Um, and uh, it's not for the pot. There's a uh, Chevron gas station. So think about <laughs> it. Uh, 
see how your morals align. They need a great social media. So sure. we'll, we'll talk about it sometime. Um, <laughs> that is it. Okay. Um, I want everyone to know that because there are a lot of Olympic trials that are going on, uh, she doesn't know this yet, but Megan the Mitch Mitchell is going to join me and Chris for a Saints Who Sport episode. And we're going to talk about all of the Saints that are headed towards Paris for the uh, Olympics. And we're going to talk about uh, who might make it and who didn't. And we went, oh, man, we know for sure that, oh, that person didn't make it. Um, all members of the church to so look forward to that in the future. We hope that this episode has nourished and strengthened your body. And that if you're not healthy enough to listen this week, you'll be able to listen next week. And that when the time comes, you will be able to travel home in safety. In the meantime, Chris at Alpine Lakes Travel, Rick McGee, Debbie Wanless, Chocolate Cake Bites Podcast, and the Tiger with a U will be saving a seat for you. On the back row. Of um, the, the Cultural, Cultural Hall. Hall. Save me a seat, it's sure to be neat. On the back row, we really gotta go on the Cultural Hall show. Ow!